All right. So this morning, of course, it's uh, it's Christmas Eve, and I like to preach sermons uh, near Christmas or Sunday, usually before Christmas, service before Christmas, uh, just about Jesus Christ and, and what he did for us. I think it's great that we set aside a, a, a day to honor and to recognize uh, the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and um, nothing necessarily new, right, in, in the sermon, depending on how much knowledge you have, but I'm, I'm covering a lot of basic truths from Scripture, but what, the goal of the sermon, I'll tell you in advance, is just to, to kind of bring honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what He did for us, and just, just to recognize and that we all can understand uh, why we celebrate, you know, why why do people put in so much effort and we do, you know, the decorations and, and you know, oftentimes people will be spending money getting gifts and, and, and things like that and preparing big meals and, and having feasts and, and just enjoying time with one another. You know, people, when you ask, uh, if you just went out and just asked random people just about Christmas and what's it all about, some people say, well, it's all about family or it's all about the presents or it's all about, you know, all these different things. And look, family is great and fellowship is great, but it's not all about that. I mean, Christmas is literally all about Jesus. At least it should be all about Jesus. Now, we should rejoice in the fact that a Savior was born as a man into this world to bring uh, salvation to all of us, right? And that's what we want to focus on, and that's what we want to honor and revere and just call to remembrance and be able to humbly and solemnly be able to recognize what was done for us, just even as a human race, that, that God loved his creation enough to, to send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come and die on the cross and, and pay for our sins. So uh, now this morning what I want to cover a little bit is it's it's the title of my sermon is the man Christ Jesus which is derived from verse number five there in first Timothy chapter two the Bible says for there's one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time now turn if you would to Luke chapter two And I'm not going to get super deep in this. I did this last year. I preached on the deity of Christ. I also preached on, on how uh, Christ also became a man because both are true 100% that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And he was born of uh, a woman, uh, of course, the Virgin Mary had a, a miraculous virgin birth. But his father was not Joseph. That was just like his stepdad because his father was, is, is God the Father, right? And he was conceived of the Holy Ghost in Mary's womb uh, when he was brought into this world, thus making him not the Son of Man and the Son of God simultaneously um, in this world. Now, I, I'm going to cover some of that, but I really just want to highlight um, you know, as we go through this, understanding the man, Christ Jesus, because what he did for us is, is so incredible, right? And, and taking aside an entire day to just focus on Christ is uh, not enough, <laughs> right? Because it's every day, really, we should be focused on our Savior, Jesus Christ, for how awesome he is and, and what he did for us. And, but, but this understanding, this knowledge of him, Jesus Christ being a man and being born into this world as a baby is also just, it, it's incredible, it's astounding to think that, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing for, to, if we just were to, in our mind, just think of like God just coming to this earth, right? If you were just, if someone were to make the statement, not just think about the Bible, just think of like God coming down to this earth, you're not going to think of God being born like as, as a baby, as an infant, as a suckling, as someone that needs to be taken care of and, and brought up and raised and everything else, you would just think God just showing up and like, boom, like being able to, you know, have lightning coming out of his fingertips or whatever, right? Like, like that would just be what we would probably think because God's almighty, God's all powerful and would make his, his, his power and, and authority known, which is how God normally does 
presents himself to mankind. I mean, when people come face to face with God in, in the scripture, you know, they fall down on their face, they're, 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 they, their knees are smitten. But what's special and unique about Jesus, about the Son of God coming into the world, was that he came as a man, right? And he came in the form of, of a human being and, and lived amongst us. And there's so many great reasons for this, and it's going to be hard to kind of get into everything that I would like to this morning. But let's just start here in Luke chapter 2, which covers the birth of Christ, of, of the man Christ Jesus. Of course, he was born of a virgin, and he literally had to be nursed and grow as a human being because he was a human being. And when I make these statements, you know, we're never forgetting that he's God in the flesh, right? So, we, you know, just, just for clarity, it's, you, you got to be able to take all of it, but, but you still have to be able to speak to the humanity of it and, and, and not have to always say, like, of course he's God in the flesh, of course he's God, you know. So just, just keep that in mind. It has nothing to do with, with uh, trying to... to don't ever form a doctrine of, of like the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons or something that just like to teach that Jesus was just a man, right? Because there's people out there who believe that stuff, and that's not what the Bible teaches at all. While, yes, he was a man, he was absolutely God in the flesh. But look at verse number six there, just, just a little bit of the story uh, surrounding his birth. The Bible says, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And we see the humble beginning of Jesus Christ. His family was essentially on the road. There was a time of taxing and they were going to have to, uh, to show up and to pay their taxes. And on the way, of course, there was, there was no room in the inn. The Bible says right before that. And there are... Um, yeah, right before that, there, there, or in this verse number seven, excuse me, there's no room for them in the inn. So, like, you know, they're traveling, hotel's booked, essentially. There's, there's no rooms available to actually take, so they have to um, just find shelter somewhere else as they're traveling that's not quite as nice accommodations. And, hey, when, when the baby's coming, the baby's coming, Right. <laughs> As we, as we all know, you know, we like to plan as much as possible for births and the pregnancies, but when, when that baby wants to come out and it's time, then it's just going to happen. You know, many, many people, I think, have had their babies delivered on the side of the road. They're driving to the hospital or whatever. You know, we, we had ours at home, uh, a couple of them, prior to our, assist, our midwives being there and just, it's time to deliver. That's it. There's no, there's no going back. There's no waiting. Yeah, go, good luck telling mom, hold, hold on a minute. Just, just wait a little longer. <laughs> you're like, yeah, right. Not happening, right? This baby's coming out and you're just going to have to catch. So something, something's going <laughs> to, there's, there's no, there's no holding off on this. So uh, when this happened, of course, you know, Jesus was, was, was born and, and they laid him in, in a manger. And um, we know, you know, we're very familiar with this story kind of in general. But one point real quick too, we, we can see there's evidence in scripture that the humble beginnings were, were really humble that, um, you know, it, it doesn't, there's no appearance that his family had a lot of money. In fact, when we see also in Luke chapter two, when it talks about his purifying and it talks about bringing him into the temple and the circumcision on the eighth day, and the sacrifice that needed to be given for a male child, it lists off, and, and I'm not going to go through, I wasn't really planning on talking about this, but the offering that they gave was um, like two turtle doves. And in the, in the law, this is one of the few sacrifices where this is the sacrifice, and I forget if it was a, like a kid of the goats or a bullock or something for the male child, but if you're not able to do that, then it's two turtle doves or, you know, like, like it was for those people who 
didn't have or maybe weren't able to afford because let's face it you know you might you could you could have children and not necessarily have a lot of money and you're not going to be able to uh, produce the, the offering that might be required so being able to have this other offering and I'm looking for the specific verse there it is verse number 24 it says and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons Two young pigeons or a pair of turtle doves is not that hard to procure, right, for, for people with any means just to, to get a couple of, of these birds to be able to offer as a sacrifice. And that is what they did here um, for Jesus, which indicates that they probably didn't have a lot of resources, a lot of money to them. And it kind of makes sense just knowing Jesus anyways that he did have a humble beginnings, you know, he, his dad was a, was a carpenter and he followed uh, in that trade at least for a little while and um, just a hard working, you, you know, we would imagine we, that it's just a hard working family, but just not really rich, not having a lot of goods in this world. And um, the humility of Christ as it is, that matches up perfectly from, uh, from birth. Now. Look down there at verse number 46 in Luke chapter 2. So Jesus was born as a, as a baby, as needing uh, to be cared for, and someone else looking after him in this, in this world. Oh, and that was, that was another point I wanted to make too. You know, we see in, in the scripture that... When, when Mary conceived, see that she was also referred to as being with child. And, you know, I've preached sermons on this before and how wicked abortion is when, you, when you're literally taking the life out of, of a woman, uh, that, that there's a life inside. That life is a child. And it doesn't matter how far developed the child is within the womb, it's still a child. And I just say this, I mean, those lives that are exterminated, what life could they have been if they'd been allowed to be born and, and grow? Like, uh, imagine this, a, a, a family with humble beginnings, with a humble uh, home that doesn't necessarily have a lot of money, because that's one of the reasons why people will choose to, to murder babies is because, oh, I can't afford this, oh, I can't do this right now, oh, I'm not in a place to, to take care of a child or whatever. Um, you know, what, what if Joseph and Mary just decided, no, you know what, we shouldn't have this baby. Let's, let's just go through and, and have an abortion. I mean, that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Obviously, God wouldn't allow for that to happen, but, um, you know, w with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, like, there's, there's no way that, that that would have happened. There's a reason why Mary was chosen. They were, they were God-fearing people. You know, they loved the Lord. They were raising Jesus in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But, just think about that of, of who might be coming into this world that then just gets exterminated. I mean, that's, that's crazy. It would be, um, we'd all be doomed if that happened to Christ. But look at verse number uh, 46 here. But then it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple. So this is uh, later on. Jesus is still a child. He's still subject to his parents. And they were all leaving and they thought that he was with other family members and just part of the group that was traveling but he hung back in jerusalem and he was he was there um talking with people in the temple and when they realized that jesus wasn't with the group they came back to to come and get him and it says this is where we're picking up in the story verse 46 and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors both hearing them and asking them questions so we see Jesus as a, as a younger child, and I don't know, I don't think it mentions specifically like how old he is at this point, but obviously he's able to have conversations with people and, and, and talk and learn, and he was old enough for them to not be super worried about where, you know, where he was in the group, so you imagine he's not just like four or five or six years old necessarily, um, just kind of like, oh yeah, well maybe he's around here somewhere, right, so but definitely still not so old where, um, you know, obviously he's still, he's still part of the family and they're coming back for him and, and 
and he's remaining uh, subject unto them and everything. But uh, they see him in the temple, and he's asking questions and, and, and hearing what, what they had to say, what these, the doctors of the, of the law, what, I mean, doctors isn't talking about like a medical doctor, like we think of today, everyone uh, that we usually deal with today is, is like medical doctors, we kind of think about that. These are doctors of the law, so these would be like, you know, people who just study the scripture and, and would know the Bible really well. These are the people that he's, he's listening to what they have to say and then also then asking some really good questions. And they're, they're amazed. It says when they, when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, or excuse me, verse number 47, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answer. So he's speaking to people who, you know, their life is kind of wrapped up in the word of God and, and being able to explain and expound the Bible and looking at the law. And they're amazed at, especially for his young age, I would imagine, his, uh, his understanding. So when they're, when they're talking about things, he, he's understanding, he's picking it up, and his answers. So when he's kind of talking back with them, talking back and forth, he's able to, the, you know, they're, they're amazed at his ability to understand things. And, but what we also need to remember is that, yes, he's God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, but he still was increasing in his understanding and his learning. He didn't come as an infant just having all knowledge, like, uh, you know, the attributes of, of God is, is, you know, having all wisdom, knowledge, understanding, knowing everything, being all powerful, and being everywhere, but Jesus confining himself to human form took on some limitations. Now, God is still omnipresent, right? There's still these attributes, which is also why the Bible talks about it being a great mystery. So that, that um, why my brain is just not firing on all cylinders this morning. Bible says great, there it is, great is the mystery of godliness, right? God was manifest in the flesh. I don't know why I could not just, I'm like turning the passage, like no, no, that's it. Great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh, right? So the fact that, that God was even manifest in the flesh is a mystery for us. It's, it's hard to, to really nail down and pinpoint, be able to spe specify how is this possible Right, that God can be can have these these confinements of being of being in the flesh, but at the same time still retaining His godhood and being you know and being God. It, it, it's it's hard to explain. We may not fully understand it now, and we might not ever fully comprehend it. But we believe it because the Bible is true, and, and the Bible tells us about this. So um, I try not to get too. Uh, specific on trying to nail down all the details on how that could be possible because it, the Bible even says it's, it's a mystery how that could happen. But we see from Scripture, apparently, Jesus did have to grow and he had to increase in his wisdom and his understanding and he had to grow. And um, the reason why I'm making such a point of this is because that it, it helps us to be able to relate to our creator, to God, to Jesus directly. And, and that in itself is this incredible thing. I mean, as a God, and, and just think about the heart of God, the character of God, the love of God. Like, if, if we were to think of ourselves, which would be a wicked thought to think of ourselves as a creator, but if, like... In our own small minds, you know, the thought to even come up that, hey, hey I made all this stuff, and the Bible says that we're, we are and we're created for his pleasure, for God's pleasure. He made us. He made everything. He made the earth. He made the universe. He made mankind. He made all the creatures of the earth. But then had it in his heart and in his mind to then not just rule over us and lord over us because i mean hey he's god and god can do whatever he wants and we're you know like we're his we belong to him we're his creation god can do whatever he wants to do in all power yet it came into his heart to 
to come and be like one of his own creation and, and to live through this life. That, that to me is fantastic. It's, a, it's amazing. It's, it's wonderful to think that we have this God that, that, that does care so much for us as his creation and it isn't just some, you know, like, like some people look at the God of the Bible like, oh, he's a mean God and everything. No, no, not at all. The love of God is, is, is awesome. And the, the, he didn't have to become one of us in order to know us because God knows everything, right? And he, he built us and created us. So he, he could have, still have that understanding, which to me implies he did that for our benefit also. For us to have that connection to him, even in just in our minds of being able to comprehend that, that God isn't so distant to us. And whether he became a man or not, for him, that, I don't think that would change anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because, because God knows everything and he knows our hearts, he knows our thoughts, and he, can, he from his side can be just as close with us whether or not he became a man. Amen. Right? But from our perspective, that makes it so much more incredible and so much more close that he decided to do that. And going back then and thinking that that came into God's heart, into God's mind to do that because he wanted us to know that he is a close savior and a God that's close at hand and someone that does care about us and love us to the point of, of humbling his own godhood to be born into this world as a child. Of course, God gets all the glory for this, but it still demonstrates his love for his creation, his love for mankind. And, and that is deserving of all praise from us, from his creation. Luke 2, uh, 48 there, I didn't, I didn't finish reading here. Verse 48, the Bible says, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, Why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And so Mary sees him and, and says, Hey, you know, why, why, why did you do this to us? Like, you know we were leaving and we left. And we had to come back for you. Like, why did you, why did you do this? And then she says this. And, and look, this is another reason why we are King James only, because these words do matter a lot. We said, Mary says, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Now, is that true? Is that what it, well, let me ask this. That is what Mary said. But how did Jesus respond to Mary he said, well, how is it that ye sought me? And then wist ye not, like, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? So she said, my, you know, your father, my, your father and I were, were looking for you. And he's like, no, don't you know that I need to be about my father's business? Now, was he talking about, was he out there building stuff as a carpenter? No, he wasn't there about Joseph's business because he wasn't referring to him. He was referring about the heavenly father, Amen. right? Because that's what he was about. And it's a rebuke to Mary because, and the reason why I bring this up, modern versions will refer to Joseph, not just in a quote by Mary. This is a quote of Mary, right? But as the narrator would refer to Joseph as being Jesus' father, but he really wasn't. He raised him as a father would, Sure, but he wasn't his father. And that is a very important distinction when we understand the deity of Jesus Christ. And it's important enough, we know it's important because Jesus corrects, specifically saying, no, I must be about my father's business. Amen. When she addressed him with, hey, your father, you know, your father and I were, were looking for you. He answers about his father and, and corrects who that really is. 
And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. They didn't, they didn't get it. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. Because Jesus was without sin and still as a child in his parents' house, he was supposed to be uh, in submission to their authority. And ju again, just that, that, that act of humility. As he's growing and understanding all these things and doctors are amazed at his understanding, at this point you can argue that he probably knew more than Mary and Joseph did, just in general with some wisdom, but he's still subject unto them. Which also, as a side note, highlights when God ordains subjection or submission, it doesn't matter who knows more or who's right. Amen. Right? So in the household, you know, ladies, when the Bible says that you're supposed to be in subjection to your own husband, it doesn't matter if you're right and he's wrong and your way is better and his is worse doesn't matter it's now the only time where it would matter is if your husband is would be commanding you to sin against God if he's telling you something sinful then that would be an area that's out of bounds because the husband is then uh, outside of his realm of authority because he needs he's in subjection to the Lord in all things and should never be commanding his wife to do something that would be against God's commandments but here which, and again, Joseph and Mary weren't telling Jesus to do anything that would be against God's commandments. He's subject unto them, though. Hey, it's time to go. We have to go. Okay. We have to go. And then he was subject unto them and uh, went along with it. So just, just, I mean, if Jesus can do it, right, we ought to be able to do that. And that, and that goes, that's not just ladies at the home. I mean, that goes on the job. That goes with your boss. You're in a position where you're underneath someone. And look, I've had to deal with this my whole life. I've always worked for someone else. I've never owned my own business. So there's been times where I felt or was convinced that my idea was better and that my way is better or whatever. But it didn't matter because if the boss tells you to do it different and to do it a different way, then you say, yes, sir. <laughs> it's, okay. It doesn't mean you can't offer an alternative and say, well, you know what? I think this might be better. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I still want you to do it this way. That's when subjection gets tested, right? Because it's, it's easy to be in obedience when you agree. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah. This is the right way. Of course it's the right way, so I'm going to do that. Great. Everyone's happy. Subjection is really tested when you don't agree. That's when it really becomes apparent whether or not you have chosen to put yourself in subjection as would be commanded. Anyhow, uh, uh, this is Christmas time. I'm not trying to make anyone feel, <laughs> feel too bad. <laughs> but it's just, I mean, you can't, I, I don't know. The Holy Spirit's leading me, I guess, because this, this was not specifically in my notes. But it is in the scripture. I was really just trying to get to verse number 52. <laughs> I'm just reading in context here, and it just kind of came out. Verse 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And, and they're just showing us Jesus is still, so obviously he wasn't all-knowing because he's increasing in wisdom. And he's increasing in stature just meaning like physically, like he's physically still growing. He's, he's not fully grown as a man yet. He's growing in stature. He's growing in, in physically. He's also growing in his understanding and gaining more and more wisdom. Also demonstrating the humanity of Christ, how, how he was a man. Even though he's God in the flesh. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, we're going to start reading in verse number 14, and this is a little, a little segue, a little bit different from, from kind of the rest of the sermon, but I, I wanted to bring it up anyways. There's a good point here that I think we need to understand, because I, I, in, the, in the 
effort to keep our mind focused on Christ at Christmas, right? To, to give the honor and glory to him. It's also a time, and you don't, we can't get around this, of giving of gifts, right? And I know for myself as a child, that's all I thought about. Like, what? You ask kid, as a kid, what's, what's your favorite, favorite holiday? My favorite was Christmas. Why? Because we all got gifts. Amen. You know, like it was, just, it was just fun. And obviously there's other things that play into that, but, but as a child, the answer was never had anything to do with Jesus. <laughs> it was, well, yeah, we got to go to church. We, we, the church that we went to, they would have a, a Christmas Eve service regardless of the day, and it was like a candlelight service and stuff, so we, we, we did that every year, which, you know what, that was a great tradition. Unfortunately, the, the church didn't bring salvation, but um, there was an effort made to keep Jesus in Christmas even with my family and my, in my upbringing. But that's not what my thought was, okay? And I might, hopefully I'm speaking more to the children now and, and less to the adults, but hey, if, if the shoe fits, you know. <laughs> gift giving is great. I'm not against it. I'm a big fan of it. I love buying gifts for people or making gifts for people or just, just giving gifts in general. Whether, you know, it doesn't have to be the money at all. It's, you know, the giving of gifts is, is wonderful. But let's give them for the right reasons. One thing we should never do I don't ever think is just is hang like a price tag over a gift over someone's head. This is why I, I despise Santa Claus yes, right. and the teaching of Santa Claus of like an elf on the shelf and everything else that's like, okay, look, you better be good or else you're not getting a gift. That is not a gift. And it's works, and this is this is what's being taught, and it's and it's sad. And look, I get it. I think most people probably don't think about this very much in depth, as with many of the other teachings of the world, many other influences of the world. A lot of times they're very subtle, but they get accepted as a culture, they get accepted as a people without really thinking about what does this really mean. And Santa Claus is probably one of the Biggest things, I mean, we've got this holiday where we are, we are honoring and celebrating the life of Jesus Christ and his birth into this world. Why? Because he's the savior of the world and we're going to give gifts to celebrate that. Amen. To, just, to just bring in the honor and, and, and to recognition, we're celebrating the birth of Christ. It's a birthday, right? And we, you know, as we would give gifts on people's birthdays, this is the best birthday for mankind, for everybody to celebrate. So we would celebrate in that giving of gifts, but then what does that turn into? Now all of a sudden you've got this other guy who has been given attributes of God. You've got this other guy that can see everything. You've got this other guy that somehow can just appear in your room with all the doors locked or in your house, right? Now look, who sees and knows everything? God. Who was able to appear in a room of people with the doors all being closed? Jesus. Right? Who knows whether you've been naughty or nice? <laughs> God does. Right? God knows all of our actions. He knows everything that we've done. But how do you receive the gift from God? Faith. Believe. Do you have to be good? Do you have to live a certain way? Do you have to follow a certain set of commandments? Absolutely not. But how is Santa Claus taught? Better be good for goodness sake. Right? Isn't that how the song goes? Yep. Santa Claus is coming to town, so you better be good. Oh, do you want to have gifts? Do you want to have something good? Then you better be good. You better obey. You better do good things. Do you see how that teaching, I mean, that's from a little child, you're telling them about this God, this lowercase g God that has these attributes of God, and you're teaching them about this person, and then they grow up and then they realize that's not real. Amen. But then you're also trying to teach them about the God of the Bible. 
Well, no, but he really does see everything. You can see where that might start to cast a little bit of doubt. And look, and, and I am not a fan. I'm, I'm, I don't have problems with people kind of joking around with their kids, right, and, and, and having a little bit of fun. But this continual lying and propping up something that's false, I think that's, that's not right. And we have to be able to just draw the distinction between, you know, playing around with the kids and getting them to, to think a certain but then, but then you always come up and be like, no, no, I'm just teasing you. I'm just joking, right? That's totally different from just propping up a lie yeah. and just building up this facade and this thing that's not real. And look, I grew up with this. I would go to bed at night and we'd leave out cookies and a glass of milk. And then he'd wake up and be like, look. Look, the cookie, there's just crumbs left here. And the milk glass is there. And it's, you know, like, and you're led to believe, because your parents are just going right along. I mean, they're the ones bringing this to you. And for a long time, I thought it was all real. And then at some point in school, like, and I remember arguing with kids. No, no way, man, this is real. And I, like, one friend was going, no, I woke up one night and I saw, you know, my mom was out there putting the gifts under the tree, you know, like, like saying that he uncovered this. And I just, I believed so much. I was just like, no way. Like, look, they might have been giving you gifts or whatever. Maybe they knew Santa Claus wasn't coming to your house. Okay, but, but, but I know that this is real, you know. And, and why would I have such a, a, a conviction on that? Why would I ever think that my parents would deceive me so? And then I felt like such a fool when I finally did come to that conclusion and realization. Like, I don't think they ever just came out and told me. You just kind of got old enough and figured out, like, wait, that's not real. And, you know, if you do this with your kids and you brought your kids in today and now you're worried or upset that, I, that I'm spilling the beans on this, I'm not sorry. I'm not. You know, now I don't intentionally go out and try to, like, you know, mess with how people are raising their kids but if you bring your kids to church you're going to hear the truth yeah. and i refuse to lie up here in the house of god especially about something like this and especially at this time of year it's it's this is what you're going to get okay and the kids deserve to know the truth and have no reason whatsoever to to doubt and, and look, parents, don't do these things to make your children then, you know, just feed them a lie and over and over and over again over the years to just realize later and then feel like a fool. I, mean, I felt like a fool when I finally got old enough and understood, like, no, that's not right. That's hurtful. And look, I'm not a snowflake going like, oh, I was abused as a child because, you know, like, <laughs> but it does shake the faith. Okay, and, and it, it's not that hard to then see how it's like, well, what else isn't real? The Easter Bunny ain't real. The Tooth Fairy ain't real. And you're trying to tell me God's real. And I can't see any of these things, right? But look at Romans chapter 5, and this is, this is why it, it is such a big deal. I talk about the gifts, and I talk about, you know, not, you, know you don't have to be good to receive the gift. And, and look, I know as a parent... You love having those incentives, <laughs> right? But I don't hang the gifts over the head because I don't want to confuse the concept of a gift with my children. And, and it can be hard sometimes because you might just be quick to, you know, it, it's easy to take some things away from kids when they're not listening, when they're not doing right, you want to punish them, like, oh, you're spending too much time on this device, so I'm going to take that device away from you for a while because it's, it's gotten out of control. You have these, these bound, you know. But don't do that with, with gifts, and I would say even especially at Christmas time. I don't think I've ever done it. I'd like to say I never have. Um, at Christmas time, for sure, like, like where I've ever said, well, you, you're not going to get any gifts if you don't clean your room or do this. I, I, because, because I have a conviction on this, that we're driving home 
the importance of the freeness of salvation and what the gift of God is. And that there's not this association with having to do good works in order to receive a gift. Look at verse number 14 in Romans chapter 5. The Bible reads, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, Judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And this is showing us that the righteousness, it was the righteousness of Christ that brings life, not the righteousness of man. Man brought sin into the world. Christ brought righteousness into the world. The righteousness is received as a gift. Hey, the, the transgression was brought in and it just passed on to all men. But the gift is brought in by one man, by Jesus Christ. He bought it. He paid for it. He lived the righteous life. He did the work for it. But for us, it's a gift. And we honor and recognize, this is why I said I like giving gifts at Christmas time, just to show the, the, the great gift that Christ made for us that's available to everyone. And to, to rejoice in the gift that Jesus Christ came as a man to this earth and was raised and grew in wisdom and stature and was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And he did it, and he had the victory, and he led the way, and he was actually able to live the perfect sinless life Amen. that we all fall short of. Amen. He was able to do it. And then he offered up himself as that sacrifice to make the payment for our sins so that he could give this gift to, the, to whosoever would call on his name, to whosoever would put their faith and their trust in him. And then he's faithful and just to give them his righteousness and to give them that free gift of eternal life. Look at Isaiah chapter 53. Almost done. When we think about the life of Jesus Christ and the man Jesus Christ that was born into this world, we also have to look at the trials that he went through and the suffering that he went through for us because this was all voluntary. This was of his will, out of his love knowing in advance what he had to do and what he had to go through, knowing before he was born into this world, because Jesus Christ is God, you know, just like the Bible talks about Melchizedek, which is a reference to Jesus Christ, without father, without mother, having uh, neither beginning of days nor end of life, right? Jesus Christ is eternal because he's God. So Jesus Christ knew the plan coming into this world and what he was going to do. And he knew what needed to be done, and he did it. And he fulfilled the whole will of God um, in spite of the shame. And, and you know, I, don't know, I don't know from God's perspective what would be harder to deal with, whether it be the physical like pain and suffering that he had to deal with, 
or the fact that you are the son of God and you're being treated that way. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I don't mean, you know, that there's nothing even proud about that. That's, that's just a fact. I mean, this is the king of kings and lord of lords, and you're the creation. And Jesus is like, I created you. And you're doing this, right? Like this is, that's, that in itself is a lot. And then, and then on top of that, everything that was done to him. And on top of that, he did everything right. And he didn't hurt anyone. And he brought healing. And he brought, you know, he was only bringing good. And he wasn't coming to judge. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, there's no reason for anybody to be so angry with Jesus that they would want to do and torture him the way that they did. No reason. He brought healing. He brought the word of God. He brought goodness and light into this dark world and still that was done to him. And even in instances where he could have been the judge, right? For example, the woman caught in adultery that was brought to him. That's, that wasn't his purpose in coming to this world. He's coming back and he's coming back to judge. Don't, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, but, but the, the goal and the purpose of him being born into this world is why we rejoice so much, especially is just that He's coming to bring forgiveness. He's coming to bring mercy. He's coming to bring love and, and eternal life, ultimately. But Isaiah 53 just, just really gets us into the heart and the mind of, of Christ. And, and, and before it ever even happened, prophesies all the sufferings and everything that Christ had to go through. Again, just showing, of course, he knew in advance what he was going to have to go through. But look at verse number one, the Bible reads, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. And, I mean, just speaking to just the, the beginnings of his physical birth here in this world, it says, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. So it wasn't this lavish ground that he was brought up in right he didn't have every it was a dry ground it's hard enough to to get a start in the dry ground and then it says he hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him jesus didn't didn't have this natural beauty in man's eyes of like wow look at how how handsome that man is we guapo right no that wasn't uh <laughs> That was that wasn't Jesus. He wasn't he he wasn't that uh, you know uh, particularly nothing noticeable about him. There was nothing that made him stand out as like well, of course this must be the Son of God. You know what I mean? Just a common man. I'm not saying he was you know beaten with the ugly stick. He's just he was just a normal normal guy. Like he was just a normal looking man. Nothing that you would you would give him an advantage. He's you know he's born in a dry ground. Everything about him was just pretty ordinary, except the fact that he's the son of God, right? But his beginnings were were definitely humble. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And, and just that alone, the Son of God coming into this world, being despised, being rejected, he felt sorrow. He knew, he knew grief. He was well acquainted with grief. He knew what it, what it felt like to be sad and to be sorrowful and to be hurt. And it says that, you know, his own creation were like ashamed of him and would like hide their face from him. Oh, I don't want to be seen with that guy, or I don't want to be, you know, like, really? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So in spite of all of this, Jesus still went through and took all the griefs. He took that burden. He took everything. He took our sin, but he took our griefs. He carried our sorrows. It says, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. No, he's taking your stuff. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He wasn't the one that was deserving of God's wrath. Or no, you are, but he's taking that for you, and the people didn't even understand that, and he still did it anyways. 
And you know, we want to talk about a good example on how we ought to live our life. You do what's right and you do what the will of God is, even if other people don't understand that and can't comprehend that, you just do it anyways. Amen. You just do it because it's right, because it's what you're supposed to do. And look, in the end, did people figure it out and understand? Yeah, in the end they did. At the time, they didn't really know, or very few people knew. But the fact that he persisted brings that much more honor and glory. And that's, and that's what we need to remember is that you need to persist. Don't faint. Uh, don't get weary in well-doing. He was wounded for our transgressions, verse number 5. And he was, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, uh, turn if you go to Hebrews 2. It's the last place I just want to look at. I'm, I wanted to expand a little bit more through that. Isaiah 53 is a, is, a, is a wonderful passage. So much greatness there. And it's clearly referring to Jesus Christ. There's so many references from the New Testament that this isn't, Isaiah 53 is not like many of the other passages in the Old Testament where you might have a couple of verses that are real prophetic, but then kind of the rest of the passage isn't so much as prophetic about Jesus. Whereas Isaiah 53 is like, it's all about Christ. It's like, like, like this is all just talking about him and what he did, which is, which is awesome because it really gives us a lot of insight into what he did for us and why we're so happy that this Savior was born into this world and why we care so much about that. And this, we ought to have that much more respect for him seeing, look, don't forget what he went through. Amen. And after everything, you know, teach your children. And if you don't have children, show the respect for yourself, for, for, for him, right, within, amongst yourselves at home when you celebrate Christmas, put time aside. You know, as you all are doing this morning, coming to church and we're hearing the word of God preached, I would say in addition to just hearing the word of God from church, have your own devotion to the Lord, especially on Christmas where you can just say, you know what, I'm going to stop everything right now for a set amount of time, and I'm going to pray to God, I'm going to thank God for what he did for us, and, and give him the honor and glory. And you know, I recommend this too, tomorrow start your day off that way. If you choose to celebrate Christmas, I doubt there's any here that doesn't. I mean, if you don't, that's fine, you don't have to. Okay, you don't have to celebrate Christmas as a holiday and you're not, like, not right with God if you choose not to, okay? i just just throwing it out there. I don't know if there's anyone uh, like that here. You know, I wouldn't think any less of you, but here's the deal. Like, it's, it's not just one day. Obviously, we should always be giving our thanks and showing reverence to Jesus Christ and to God the Father and to the Holy Ghost because of what is done for us, right? I mean, this should be a part of our daily life, but if you choose, to, especially if you choose to celebrate a day, that would honor the birth of Christ, put aside that time and make sure that that is, you know, what is leading the celebration. More, that, that surpasses everything else. The family time, the fellowship time, the gift giving time, like all of that is all because of Christ. 
So don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of what he did. Don't lose sight of everything that he went through and his love to bring us the gospel and to bring us the uh, eternal life that we don't deserve. Hebrews chapter 2, I want to close on this passage here. Look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And you know, the grace of God wasn't for him, it was for you. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't God's grace that he tasted death. It was God's grace you know, for, you know, for Jesus to taste it. It was God's grace for you that he tasted death for every man. And, I mean, if you think about it, he was made a little lower than the angels. First of all, just being made lower on the totem pole or on the power of his own creation. So he's made lower. And then what was he made for? For death. He was born to die. That was his goal. That was his mission. And obviously it's more, you know, broader than that because he, he was born to bring light. He was born to bring the truth. He was born to, uh, to be righteous and to fulfill the law. He was born to do many things, but ultimately, if you just really just kind of encapsulate this real, he was born to die, but he's not only born to die, he was born to die and rise again. Right? He came into this world. We celebrate his birth because it's such a great uh, um, day to just, just think on it. And look, we know that December 25th, Probably wasn't the day that he was born, like, like literally in a calendar. But I don't, that doesn't bother me whatsoever. And again, if that bothers you and you choose not to, that's fine. That's your, you know, do what you want to do. This isn't something in Scripture that tells us you must celebrate Christmas. I just don't see anything wrong in honoring our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that's what it's, if, if, you know, making this day about celebrating the birth of Christ, I think it's wonderful. And, and I still think it's a great opportunity as to bring the gospel to a lost world. It's a, it's a one of, you know, people want to talk about the pagan roots and everything, all this other stuff with, with Christmas and, and history and everything else. Look, here's what I see about Christmas. One, I see God's people celebrating the birth of Christ. Now, of course, not everyone in the world is doing that. Some people are doing all these other things and have all these other traditions and do their different things or whatever, okay? But this is what we do. This is what I do. And this is what many, many, many other people do too. It's where this is not unique in, in you know, for like us or our group or our church or, or my family or something to just be focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ. Of course not. But it also brings out you know, I mean, even the hymns, like the hymns that we sing, those are being out in public still. Yeah, there's a lot of bad stuff out there. There's a lot of things that have nothing to do with Jesus out there, of course. But just the fact that there's this day or this time of year where there's much more exposure to the truth. To, you know, like I see that as a win. I do. I see that as a positive thing. As opposed to, let's say, Everyone just chose, like, no, let's just not celebrate Christmas. Now you've, like, that, you don't have this opportunity to, to put good truth, scripture, great hymns, great truths out into the public. Very often you'd just be eliminating one more opportunity for that. So anyways, I don't want to go on and on about that. That's not really what the sermon's about. Let's continue reading here in Ephesians chapter 2 because I want to just get through this and we'll, be doing, and we'll uh, call it a morning. Verse 10 reads, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject 
to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. Again, this reference to, you know, he was not made in the likeness of an angel, but of, uh, of men. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. Verse 17, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And this is just my last point on Jesus Christ being born and being born a man, not being born an angel, not being born anything higher than what we are when he came into this, into this world. He took on the seed of Abraham, a man in the flesh. And he considers us his brethren. How much more endearing from your creator, from your Lord, from your savior, from the king of kings and Lord of lords, can you, can you get than to call you a brother? Like that's mind-blowing. That God cares that much to, to treat you as family with him. That's what a brother is, is your family. And look, we're, we're adopted children. We're born of, of, of the word of God. We're born of that seed that's planted. You know, spiritually, we have this new life and this new birth through Christ. It has nothing to do with our righteousness, but, but God wants that connection. He wants that with us. He's given us that choice. He's given us everything. That gift is available. It's out there. It's, it's there. Let's, let's let the world know. And, and why did he do this? Verse 17. It behooved him to be like this. Why? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. He did all this so that he could be merciful. Merciful and faithful. Right? Both simultaneously. God has great mercy. It's a great reason to rejoice and be happy. There is mercy. You are wicked. There is mercy. You're a sinner, but there's mercy. There's forgiveness. God loves you and he still wa he wants to have this great familial relation with you. This is what it's all about. This is why we focus so much on trying to reach souls. The gospel of Christ. Because we receive that gift. And those of us that have received it, we know it's free. It's free. And he did all the work for it. And that's the best gift you could ever receive. But and as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of Christ, hey, don't lose sight of the freeness of that gift. Let's share that gift with everyone. If you don't, and this is the best thing about this gift, you don't need any money to give that gift. To help other people receive that gift requires zero dollars. Just a little bit of your time. Let other people know about the best gift you could ever receive in the world. Gift of eternal life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for, um, for everything. Lord, we thank you for, for your goodness, for your mercy. God, help us as sinners to uh, put away the lusts of our flesh. Help us to um, continue to reach more people with the gospel. And, and Lord, thank you for the gift I pray that you please bless uh, these, um, these special days that, that we use to honor you. And um, Lord, help us to just be refocused in our hearts and our minds to serve you and to, um, to praise you for, for the great gift of salvation. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.